Hello, I'm Deborah Chung. I'm very happy to share with you a slice of history in my mother, Rebecca Chan Chung. My two great-great-grandfathers, Reverend Chow and Reverend Wan, were pastors uh, in southern China in, at, toward the end of the Qing Dynasty. Uh, Reverend Chow was the first Chinese ordained minister of the Methodist Church in southern China. His church, the Methodist Church in Guangzhou, China, is shown here. Um, and he, he served there for 39 years. Um, and this uh, here uh, shows people <laughs> having the Qing Dynasty hairstyle. Um, and they're all guys, no, no women. I, supposedly, at that time, men and women wouldn't take, have pictures together. His son uh, uh, is married to a daughter of Reverend Wen. Um, so this is his son, Mr. Chow. Uh, because he knew English, he became uh, the Chinese teacher of missionaries. Uh, and his wife, Miss Wen. Um, and this is one of their daughters, uh, Lee Sun Chow, in Hong Kong when she grew up. And she became my uh, maternal grandmother. Um, at that time, there was a big problem among the Chi uh, Chinese women, and that is foot binding, which uh, causes, caused the women to have to rely on other people. So there was great need to promote the education of women. Ms. Wen, the, the wife of uh, Mr. Chow, with the permission of the Hong Kong government, she founded a school for girls. Okay? And, and, and this is my grandmother, Miss Chow. Uh, and this is her sister. Okay? And this is just very uh, unusual. A Chinese woman of that <laughs> century, uh, not, not, not having her feet bound, and on top of that, became a school principal, founding a school for girls. Another problem with Chinese women at that time was that Chinese women resisted seeing male doctors. In fact, uh, uh, th they wouldn't even go to a hospital to have the child, uh, 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 to have their babies born. As a result, a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of them <laughs> lost their lives because they wouldn't go to a hospital for the childbirth. So there was great need to train female doctors. So the Presbyterian Church of USA sent Dr. Mary Fulton, a missionary, to Guangzhou, China. She spoke Cantonese. And this is Dr. Fulton talking to a, a patient right before a surgery. Um, uh, and she founded Hackett College of Medicine for Women, located in Guangzhou, China. And this is the first college of medicine for women in China. Uh, at that time, uh, men and women would not study together. Uh, and the students uh, uh, were trained very well. Uh, th they were here doing lab work. I still have <laughs> the mortar and pestle of my grandmother. Um, and the, the students uh, did morning exercise, also morning worship. Uh, and this is my grandmother, uh, Dr. Chow, uh, graduating. And this is the commencement exercise. Um, and after graduation, she became a, a physician. That's, that's Dr. Chow. Um, in the David Gregg Hospital for Women and Children, which was at the same place uh, as that Hackett uh, uh, College of Medicine for Women. Um, and her husband is Mr. Chan. And Mr. Chan was a revolutionary under Dr. Sun Yat-sen, participating in the 1911 Chinese Revolution, which changed China from an empire to a republic. 
Uh, and my grandfather went from Hong Kong to Singapore in order to prepare for the Chinese Revolution. Um, the the uh, uh, preparing for the revolution was very dangerous uh, in Hong Kong and in China, uh, less dangerous in Singapore. And in Singapore, he founded uh, this newspaper uh, which uh, promoted the revolution. Uh, and also he raised fund for supporting the revolution. Uh, in Singapore, there was the China Revolutionary Alliance, which uh, was the organization of Dr. Sun. And this picture was taken in 1907, before the 1911 revolution. And uh, great uncle Dr. Wang uh, is this person. Uh, the, he uh, 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 was my great uncle. and he sheltered uh, Dr. Sun in Singapore. And this is Dr. Sun in the middle. A great, great uncle of mine, Dr. Wen, that is the brother of Ms. Wen, um, also a, 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 a son of Reverend Wen, he went to secondary school together with Dr. Sun. This, this is the school in Hong Kong. And uh, after that, both Wen and Sun became doctors of Western medicine. And they had a joint medical clinic together. And this is an 1894 uh, ad of that joint clinic. Uh, and with both of them being Christians, they founded a Christian newspaper called Great Light in Hong Kong. Um, and Dr. Sun wrote for that newspaper in May of 1911. He wrote four characters, meaning the Christian uh, faith and the nation experienced together spring. Um, and this is the church atten attended by both Sun and Wen in Hong Kong. Uh, um, and this church was very close to the medical college attended by Sun. My mother, Rebecca, uh, was born in 1920. That's my mother and, and her parents. And, uh, she was born in the warlord era, okay, 1920. Now, the revolution was in 1911. But after the revolution, uh, China was effectively divided among various regional factions, as shown here. Um, it, it was uh, a period uh, of a, a lot of uh, riots and so forth. And because of that danger, my grandmother took my mother, uh, and they moved from Guangzhou to Hong Kong, leaving my grandfather in Guangzhou uh, to pursue his uh, political work. Um, and in Hong Kong, my grandmother became the matron of the Hong Kong Sanatorium Hospital. So she and my mother just lived in the dormitory there. Uh, and my mother uh, went to secondary school in diocesan girls' school, uh, at the top school in Hong Kong. Uh, but it, it's far away. Uh, she had to cross the Hong Kong Harbor onto uh, the other side. Uh, so each trip to school took an hour by bus and by ferry. Um, and in 1938, my mother graduated, and this is a picture taken during the graduation outing. Okay. Quite a few of her classmates uh, have, uh, are biracial, uh, Chinese and British. Uh, this is the secondary school uh, graduation paper. Uh, actually, it is uh, the admission <laughs> card to the final uh, examination. Uh, and. Um, uh, this is my mother, uh, and her principal's signature is on the, on the photo. Um, 
this shows my mother, Rebecca, and her younger brother, David. David was three years younger than Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca graduated near the top of her class, but she volunteered not to pursue university education in order to save the family's money for her brother's future university education. At that time, uh, it was very expensive to study in the University of Hong Kong. Okay. It was a, a, a voluntary sacrifice for her brother. So uh, my mother uh, uh, went to Queen Mary Hospital in Hong Kong to receive nursing training. Uh, no tuition involved, and she uh, received a little salary for that. Uh, at 9 p.m., the wart's lighting was to be dimmed. Uh, so, and my mother uh, noticed a patient reading her Bible. And the patient was a young woman uh, uh, studying in a seminary. And this patient asked my mother, have you come to believe in Jesus? And my mother said, I believe. I have been going to church to worship God since I was a small child. And the patient asked, are you saved at this point? And my mother said, if I were to leave the world now, I believe that I'm saved because I have always been a good child. Then the patient said, what you said indicates that you are not saved yet. <laughs> and the patient took the Bible and opened to Ephesians 2, 8, chapter 2, verse 8. And there it says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. After about 10 days of thinking, my mother finally understood. She knelt down to pray and repent. On December 10, 1941, which was two days after the invasion of Hong Kong by Japan, my mother was given the nursing graduation certificate in an emergency fashion. Uh, if she had pursued university education instead of nursing, she would have completed only one year of university education before having to stop the education for the war. So her decision to forsake university education really ended up very, very well, uh, so that she was able to have her nursing credentials uh, during the Second World War. Now, going from Queen Mary Hospital, uh, where my mother studied and got her, uh, her uh, credentials, and going from there back home to, uh, um, to the Sanatorium Hospital, uh, that was, uh, had to be by, by walk, by walking, and quite a distance. Uh, um, and uh, very dangerous because there were uh, Japanese soldiers guarding here and there. Um, and Ama Sheng, shown here, risked her life to take Rebecca, disguised as an old woman, from Queen Mary Hospital back home. And uh, really thankful to Ama Sheng. Uh, Free China is the area in white. Uh, and that's the area that was not yet occupied by Japan. Um, so pretty much all the young people in Hong Kong w want to flee Hong Kong for free China because th there was n nothing much available, uh, no school, no job, <laughs> nothing much uh, left in Hong Kong during the Japanese occupation. Um, a pastor led my mother and a group of over 100 young people to flee Hong Kong to Guangzhou by boat. And Rebecca's group stood in the rain, waiting from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. for the Japanese guard to allow them to cross the border. And finally, because of the rain, uh, the, the Japanese guard allowed them to go through. After crossing the border into so-called no man land, the sun shone and the soaked luggage became dry in less than half an hour. And mother was very thankful to God for that. 
Uh, and they stayed in the Methodist Church, uh, founded by my great-great-grandfather in Guangzhou. And my mother wrapped her Bible in newspaper and started to walk to the nearby home of her primary school Bible teacher for Bible study. As she walked, a thief snatched her Bible, thinking that it was cookies. Then she chased after the thief over several streets and finally used her umbrella to hook the thief. The Bible was thus dropped and she got it back. This is the typical journey of people fleeing Hong Kong. He's Hong Kong and, and this is uh, uh, Guangzhou, uh, number two. And, and so and he, uh, at the end of the journey, uh, that's Chongqing. Um, and a, a part of that journey involved taking a train. And uh, my mother had lost all her luggage during, uh, uh, because of the train travel. However, the Bible remained because that was hand carried. Uh, the last leg of that journey was from Guiyang to Chongqing. There was a road but no public transportation. The only uh, possible way uh, of transportation was to use the trucks of Friends Ambulance Unit. Uh, this organization uh, used trucks to transport medical supplies. Um, and they let people ride on top of the goods, very high up, uh, very dangerous. Um, and uh, in Guiyang, my mother went to the uh, office of the Friends Ambulance Unit to ask about the schedule of the trucks. And when she got to the office, she was surprised to see that everybody was Caucasian. They were all missionaries. And uh, after a half-day dangerous journey, my mother then uh, 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 arrived at Chongqing from Guiyang. Chongqing was the wartime capital of China, very heavily bombed by Japan. In Chongqing, she applied to and was accepted by the Flying Tigers in Kunming to be a nurse there. And this is the clinic of the Flying Tigers. And this is my mother. And this is the hospital, and that at the back is my mother. Um, and uh, it's very simple, one story wooden structure, that's the hospital. Um, and her immediate supervisor was Dr. Fred Manger, a lieutenant colonel. He was a missionary from a church in southern U.S. In fact, he arrived in China back in 1909, decades before the Second World War. He founded the Huzhou General Hospital, and he spoke Shanghainese. Now, air raids by Japan occurred very often at Kunming Airport, which was used by the Flying Tigers. And whenever that happened, uh, the airmen would run to their aircraft in order to fight the enemy in the sky. And the siren obviously uh, would sound. And when that happened, the nurses would take those patients that could not walk and put them on stretches and put the stretches underneath the beds of the patients. And for the patients that could walk, the nurses would accompany them to a nearby air raid shelter and stay there and wait, waited there until the siren kind of uh, uh, stopped. Um, and one time uh, after uh, uh, the siren stopped and they returned to the hospital, they were startled because injured airmen were taken to the hospital by trucks, truck after truck of injured airmen. It, it was a, a terrible incident. Uh, so the few nurses bandaged the, the wounds and even administered morphine to the injured airmen. And to my mother's surprise, quite a lot of the injury occurred at the buttocks. 
And the reason why that occurred is that the airmen had to run to the aircraft. But some of them did not run fast enough. And the shells came, and they were, they were drooped, you know, and the buttocks were facing up. And, and so the butt, buttocks got shelled. Now, Kuanming is a beautiful place. And my mother used these U.S. Army jeeps uh, as uh, her convenient means of transportation. There was no U.S. Air Force at that time, not yet. Uh, so my mother w uh, was under the Army. Um, and my mother really enjoyed the peaches of Kunming, very famous, the peaches. And, and she would go to uh, the, the nearby uh, uh, location where there, there were peach trees, and she said she could eat even 10 peaches at a time. <laughs> now, uh, China's east coast then became mostly occupied by Japan. So one need to use the China's back door, uh, which involved driving over the Himalayas. Uh, this is the Himalayas in, in white. And one had to drive over that, the only way in and out of China. Uh, and the road is called the Burma Road in yellow here, uh, from Kunming in China to Burma. It's a very hazardous road, a lot of accidents and even deaths on the road. Um, very winding. Uh, uh, and the ambulance, a friend's ambulance unit used truck convoys. Here's a truck here, you know, a <laughs> little truck, you know, another truck. Uh, uh, tr you, they used truck convoys on the Burma Road in order to transport medical supplies from outside China to China. Uh, um, and about 90% of the medical supplies used by the Chinese civilians during the war was transported by the Friends Ambulance Unit. Uh, this unit also uh, uh, provided medical services. They also uh, uh, did human, human, humanitarian work in Europe because it was a world war uh, in Finland, in Germany, in North Africa, and so on. Uh, and in 1947, the Friends Ambulance Unit was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, the, this unit was organized by a church. It was the Christian church called Quakers, with both UK and US involved. The UK mainly sent missionaries, while the US in, uh, provided the trucks. Um, well, later on, Japan cut off the Burma Road. So the only way out would be the f flying over the Himalayas. And this is the famous hump route. Um, this is considered the most dangerous in the history of aviation because of the high mountains, the strong wind, the propeller planes, not jet planes, <laughs> and also the inadequate communication basically no communication, uh, no computer. Um, they wouldn't know, say, how's the weather up there? How, how strong the wind up there? <laughs> they wouldn't know, It'd just go up. <laughs> uh, very dangerous. And many planes crashed and are still there today. My mother then joined the China National Aviation Corporation, CNAC. Uh, uh, that, that's the organization that pioneered hump flights. And this organization is uh, um, operated or owned by both the U.S. and China. The U.S. is Pan Am. Okay. Uh, and the headquarters of CNAC was in India because uh, China uh, was in very bad shape because of the war. So. Uh, my mother, uh, as a nurse, as well as a, a, f a flight stewardess uh, for CNAC, she flew over the hump regularly. 
And this is her CNAC ID with her signature, Rebecca Chan. And this is her badges. Uh, the CNAC transported mainly medical supplies. Uh, um, and uh, this is uh, the pro one of the propeller planes. See how, how simple it is. And passengers boarded, boarded the plane using a simple ladder. <laughs> uh, and uh, a lot of the pilots and mechanics were from the US. Uh, so my mother uh, uh, flew, that, that's part of her work. She would fly from Calcutta, India to Kunming, China, and then uh, 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 continue on from Kunming uh, to the north to Chongqing. Um, and, and she flew over the hump for about 50 times. And this is uh, one of the aircrafts, uh, uh, and this is the sign for CNAC, and you can see it's a propeller plane, no jet plane. Uh, my mother's plane is shown here, okay, with her passengers deplaning. Uh, and inside the plane, there was no window, <laughs> just like that. And walking uh, along the aisle in the middle involved a balancing act, <laughs> nothing to grab on. Uh, yeah, in, uh, in one of the flights, the plane wobbled tremendously. It, was, it, it wobbled for about 20 minutes. And nobody knew what was happening because there was no window. And my mother didn't know what, what was happening either. So after the wobbling finished, then my mother walked uh, to the pilot's cabin in front and asked the uh, pilot what happened. And the pilot told her, a Japanese military plane was following them. So they had to hide between the mountain peaks as they flew. Very, very dangerous. In addition to flying, my mother kept the medical record of each CNAC employee and also administered the annual physical examinations. Uh, in addition, she was the organist in the Chinese church in Calcutta, India. And these are the Sunday school students there. Um, my mother was honorably discharged by the U.S. Army, and she received these U.S. World War II medals, as well as the U.S. Congressional Gold Medal, the front and back sides. And her uh, her uh, burial uh, ceremony uh, uh, involved the U.S. military kind of uh, ceremony uh, with a veteran offering a, um, a U.S. flag, supposedly from uh, the President of the United States, to the family, uh, uh, represented by my elder sister. Uh, the TV came, and also uh, various veterans came to honor my mother. Now, going back now to 1941, when Japan invaded Hong Kong. Here is the picture of the Japanese soldiers entering Hong Kong. There were about 35,000 of them, and they faced a garrison of only 13,500, consisting of British, Indian, Canadian, and local troops. Uh, the 18-day Battle of Hong Kong, as it was called, started on December 8, 1941, a day after Pearl Harbor. My father, Leslie Chung, as a gunner in the Hong Kong Volunteer Defense Corps, was wounded in action at a fort in Hong Kong. Okay. Uh, the, the fort uh, uh, guarding the Victoria Harbor, which is the Hong Kong Harbor. Um, uh, his facial nerve was cut by shrapnel, thus affecting the mouth, an eye, and an ear. Uh, she was, he was uh, 25 years old at that time. He went to Calcutta for medical treatment in 1943, and there he met his future wife. 
and both of them loved music. Two years later, they were married in Calcutta. Uh, and you can see broken chairs in, in the uh, wedding reception. Uh, it, it was still during the war. One and a half month after the wedding, father went to the U.S. for university education, so the newlyweds became separate for three and a half years. During the three and a half years, they did not meet, did not have telephone conversations because it w was too expensive. They only wrote letters to one another. Very unusual for newlyweds. After the war, um, my mother moved to Shanghai from India with CNAC. And this is a photo uh, in Longhua Airport in China around 1947. Uh, uh, it, it's a big, big organization, CNAC, uh, headquartered in Longhua Airport. And this is the medical building you know, with the medical staff in front. And that's my mother. Um, and she also flew to various cities to provide medical service. In addition, she trained air hostesses in first aid. And this is the first class of air hostesses. Unfortunately, one of them died later in a plane crash. And this is the second class, uh, all happening in Longhua Airport in Shanghai. My mother paid for the medical education of her, her younger brother. Uh, and in late 1948, she resigned from CNAC because she wanted to go back to Hong Kong in view of the Civil War in China. Um, and so this, she was reunited with her parents in Hong Kong. And my, my father also graduated, uh, uh, so returned to Hong Kong. So they reunited in Hong Kong after three and a half years of separation. Um, and then my mother gave all her savings to her younger brother for his medical education in Canada. However, she bought land in Qingyi Island in Hong Kong for the retirement home of her parents. Um, the land was very inexpensive, seven Hong Kong cents per square foot, but she had to borrow money to be able to buy it, uh, 50,000 square feet of, of the land. Uh, uh, this is inside the house. Um, and after 30 years, the Hong Kong government bought the land in order to build this Ting Yi bridge, which needed the land to build the bridge. Um, and, and this land sale allowed her to live comfortably during her retirement. Uh, my parents had two daughters, and I'm the younger one. Uh, my mother was elected president of the Hong Kong Nurses and Midwives Association, and uh, she was speaking in the celebration of the International Nurses Day, May 12, 1948. May 12 is the birthday of Florence Nightingale, the founder of modern nursing. And Nightingale became famous because of her nursing work uh, during the uh, Crimean War. Okay. Uh, in the 1853 to 1856. Um, this war involved Britain, France, and Turkey fighting against Russia <laughs> over Crimea. <laughs> it ki ki um, uh, the present Ukraine war kind of mirrors uh, the Crimean War. So history kind of repeats itself. And this war is the first war with technology, namely rifles. And this picture shows British soldiers with rifles leaving Britain for the Crimean War. 
1961, my mother was appointed by the governor of Hong Kong as a member of the Hong Kong Nursing Board. She was then sent to Australia in 1962 for training in nursing education. And after returning to Hong Kong, uh, she was promoted to head the nursing school of the Tonghua Group of, of Hospitals. Um, and she literally trained a generation of nurses for Hong Kong. My mother said, that this nursing school was the biggest in Hong Kong, even bigger than all of those in Britain. Then I asked her, was it the biggest in the world? <laughs> and then she said, no, I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, it's a big one. <laughs> um, my mother ha ha was always active in the church, uh, singing and teaching Sunday school. She was my Sunday school teacher also. And she was a trained soprano. This is her singing solo in a home concert. And this is her uh, as the leader of a church choir. Uh, this is the church, Methodist Church of Hong Kong. And at age 72, she was still singing very well. Uh, this is at home in Toronto, and I was accompanying her on the piano. At age 90, she was still singing. <laughs> On her last New Year's Eve in 2010, when she was 90 years old, she wrote, asking the Lord for more opportunities to witness for Him. She did not ask for health or long life, but God answered her prayer indeed. And this is her book piloted to serve her bio autobiography. And uh, this is the Chinese version. Uh, this is uh, in uh, traditional Chinese. And there's also one in abbreviated Chinese. And Anna Cheno, the wife of uh, General Cheno, uh, uh, she was a friend of my mother. And she wrote the foreword in Chinese for the book. Uh, and uh, because my mother passed away uh, soon after the publication of the book, I re represented her in, uh, uh, you know, in, in taking interviews from the media and also in speaking to various uh, audiences. And this is the audience in Diocesan, Diocesan Girls School where my mother graduated. Over a thousand students here listening to my sharing about my mother. And this is the Kuanghua Hospital, the hospital where my mother taught nursing. And you can see all these white caps, <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know, um, nurses in various types of uniforms, uh, all there to listen to uh, my sharing of, of my mother's experience. I'm really thankful to God for my dear mother. Thank you.